Uh, hi, this is Phil Chandler and uh, this is the 1st of January 2019 and so this is my uh, New Year's message <laughs> for, what it, for what it's worth and uh, a little bit of a warning actually as well. Uh, warning to health warning to beekeepers which I'll come to in a minute. Um, meanwhile I've just been doing this little bit of routine maintenance which I'd be uh, meant to do a while ago but um, this little nuke box here uh, is a wooden box. It's actually made out of one of Brother Adam's old um, honey uh, boxes, the ones he used to transport um, jars of honey and, and uh, comb honey in. And I've turned it into a into a nuke because it happens to fit um, national frames rather well. And I came up to the apiary here and I discovered that I had left this um, rotary door, gate, whatever it's called, uh, in, in that position, like so, and so the bees were having trouble squeezing through the through the, uh, the grid there, that's actually a queen excluder officially, but I think these bees are, they were struggling actually, they were, they were kind of half in half out some of them, so I've just gently removed this completely and they're now coming in and out and flying around. It's been a really warm sunny day, you can see the, the sun's just going down now behind the tree, it's, Temperature's starting to drop now, but it's been a really amazing day today. And so I just thought I'd come around and check up on a few things. Um, all the colonies in this apiary are doing fine. They're all they're all in good shape. You can see around, if I look around quickly, there's a few, few hives here, different shapes and sizes. They're all good. They're all got plenty of food. But this one didn't have any way of feeding it. And it's, it's quite a... Um, it's got quite oh, quite a lot of weight to it, so I know they've got plenty of stores in there, but I was a bit concerned because I like to have always in the winter a lump of fondant where I can see it and where the bees can get at it. And you can see I've made a little opening here in the, um, this is Reflectix material on the top, and uh, I've propped it open with a twig because if you, if you let it go, you can see it'll, it'll actually close itself up, which obviously trap bees above it which is not a clever idea so there's a few bees come up and they, they're now nibbling away at the fondant there so although they've got plenty of food inside it means that they've always got that reserve and it's, it gives them something to do as well I mean I know it may be, sound a bit silly but um, it gives them something to do when, when there's nothing else uh, there's no flying to be done um, particularly so there we go now I'm gonna put another piece of reflectix on top of this and then I'm just gonna put the uh, the normal drop over lid back on. Um, for now I'll just put the lid on just to keep the heat in. So there we go, so that's going to get uh, have it strapped back on and that'll be fine and I can now keep an eye on it really easily um, by means of just lifting the top and that's true of all my, all the nukes here have got feeders on or um, some other way of um, observing them and uh, let's actually go and look at one of these poly nukes here. This is one that I've got on the top. It's got, you can see here, there's a big lump of fondant right there. And there's a hole uh, in the, I think it's Corex I used on this particular one, uh, so they can feed from underneath. And you'll probably find that if I was to poke around, that block of fondant's probably um, hollowed out to some extent. Um, this is not an official uh, feeder. For a polyhive, this is actually, or polynuke rather, this is actually um, an extender. It's got a bit of black mould on the top here where damp gets trapped under the under the acetate sheet, but that's nothing to worry about. Um, this is actually a converter um, so that you can use deep um, national frames in the basic brood chamber, which is down here. As you can see, this is number 21. Um, but I've actually, uh, I don't use deep frames, so I've actually used it as a, as a, as an eek, really. Um, and I put a piece of Corex over the surface under there, and you can see there's actually a, there's a tunnel up, and there's some bees down in there, which you probably can't see because it's dark. Um, there's some bees down there on, on some fondant, which is also in the side feeder. But it means that the bees have always got food above them, and I prefer that, I must say. Um, I'm not overly fond of these side feeders, um, particularly in winter, because it's not easy to see what's in there. And if you try to add more fondant to a side feeder, you're in danger of actually squashing bees as the fondant drops into position. And obviously you don't want to be feeding liquids in winter in any case. 
Um, so I prefer this, this method of feeding on the top, also because I can see at a glance, um, in this particular case I can't because the fondant's actually covering the feed hole, but I can see there's fondant there. So I know these bees are fine, I know they've got food, and I can confirm that also by you know just, gent just hefting the hive, so I can put my hand under there and I can just give it a little bit of a, a lift and I can feel that that is quite heavy. Um, I know that's entirely unscientific and I should probably put a, you know, if I was going to be scientific about it, I would put um, a, a spring balance or something on there. I'll tighten that up in a minute when I've got another hand free. Um, same goes for the top bar hives. I've got, um, uh, these, these guys have pretty much stopped flying now because the temperature's dropped, but they were flying earlier. So all's well and everything's fine here. Um, and the... Okay, so let's come now to the to the little health warning I wanted to give you. So I'm looking right into the camera now with the sun uh, set in front of me, and I know you're you're used to seeing my normally um, peachy and flawless complexion uh, on these videos, um, but you might be able to see right now, right under this eye here, there's a, a dark spot. Now that dark spot wasn't there as of the beginning of November last year. So literally two months ago, there was nothing there. Um, this has developed, it developed actually very quickly in a space of about 10 days. And it's actually one of three possible types of skin cancer. Um, and that I'm hoping to, I, I, I'm on a list to have, a, have an operation on it soon. It, it, you know, it's probably quite a routine thing. It's probably nothing, nothing you know, I'm not particularly worried about it. Um, it's operable and uh, relatively common. So. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that I'm, my life's in danger or anything like that, because I don't think it is. But uh, this is just to kind of um, flag up a possible warning, really, because uh, it's been a really hot, sunny summer here in 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 England, in southwest England, this year, 2000, last year, as it was now, of course, 2018. Um, and I was out in it a lot, and I was I was in the sun a lot. I wasn't, I don't sunbathe, I don't lie around in the sun, doing nothing. But you know, I'm out a lot in in, in the apiaries. Usually I have a hat of some sort on, but, you know, uh, it looks like this was probably caused by um, too much sun exposure. So, two things really. One is, you know, if you see a, a dark um, spot, and this is, this is apparently quite a, a typical place for these things to develop. If you see something like this on your skin and it's not normally something you would, you would have, then... Um, just keep an eye on it because if it if it gets into your if this spreads into your lymph nodes, then you can be in serious trouble, and you know then you're talking about serious chemotherapy and things. So um, hopefully this is benign, and you know hopefully you'll never get anything like this. But uh, just a warning, really, for people like beekeepers who are out in the sun a lot. Keep an eye on your skin, uh, parts of your body that are exposed to the sun routinely or frequently. Uh, just keep an eye on it, and if anything like that develops, then go see your doctor pretty quickly, like I did. And um, in this country, the NHS being, uh, you know, totally wonderful, and uh, how the hell would we do without it? But um, you know, they're on it straight away. They were on it, and and they got me an appointment with a consultant. So. And you know I'm expecting to have an operation anytime soon. So there you go. Uh, just a little warning. And other than that, um, I hope you have a great year with your bees. And uh, I'll be making some more videos soon. And this year, my plan is to make a lot more videos, particularly about um, two things. One is top bar hives. I've I've neglected um, top bar hives a bit o over the last couple of years because I've been busy doing other things. Uh, but also the um, uh, I'm really uh, getting very interested in this whole business of um, the potential interrelationships between bees and fungal mycorrhizum, and. This has been inspired by, uh, largely by the American mycologist uh, Paul Stametz, and I, I th thoroughly uh, recommend going look, looking for his videos on YouTube. Um, and some of you may be aware that, that uh, a few years ago now I came up with this potential um, kind of rather fuzzy idea of, of something I called an eco floor. And um, actually, uh, this hive here, for example, you can see. If I point the camera in that direction, you can see has um, one 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 version of the eco floor, which um, 
is uh, is actually made from industrial guttering, and the idea being to keep you know to retain moisture in, in the uh, in the in the bottom of the hive there, but also to ma to maintain um, an ecosystem hopefully which uh, which has the ability to um, hold things like fungi and um, uh, also small creatures like um, the stratulilaps and, and the uh, earwigs and woodlice and things like that, which are all things that bees um, evolved with, grew up with, if you like, and live with commonly in hollow trees. And so, they, you know, they're, they're used to each other. And um, I, I have a strong suspicion, and this is, you know, again, it, it, not scientific, but it's a suspicion and it's, it's, a, it's more than that. It's more of an intuition, I guess, that there are relationships that we need to investigate between um, other parts of the natural world and um, and honeybees, particularly, of course. Um, and this is this is um, comes from a, a stream of thought that I that I did talk about on my EcoFloor videos, which is that um, bees do not naturally live in sterile, um, empty environments like beehives you know we tend to think of a beehive as a sterile box in which you keep only bees and you make sure nothing else lives there well that's completely unnatural um, and nothing in nature lives in isolation like that and so the thinking my thinking was that you know what we should be thinking about is creating uh, not not empty sterile beehives but actual ecosystems in which bees can thrive so there you go, that's, that's all I want to say about it right now, but I should be talking more about that and doing more investigative work on that during the, this, this coming year. So there you go, so Happy New Year to everybody, and uh, I hope to meet at least some of you during the course of the year. Okay, that's it for now. Cheers, bye-bye.